Welcome, welcome. Welcome everybody, lovely to see you. Hello. Welcome, hi, some new faces. Hello, new faces. Hello. I'm not going to say old faces, <laughs> known faces, known faces. Welcome, we normally just give a couple of minutes for people to join up. Everybody's coming in thick and fast, which is fantastic. And then we'll get going. Big shout out to, to our friends across the world. Bertrand, I can yeah, see you. Are you in, are you in uh, Switzerland there? Great to see you. Awesome. And Natalie from Sydney, Australia. That's a good one. That's the middle of the night. <laughs> Looking Hi, remarkably Natalie. fresh, Natalie. <laughs> pressure on me then to keep you entertained isn't it we might lose you you might start sleeping <laughs> it's just a signal whether i'm doing a decent job or not <laughs> right then so we're nearly ready just for 30 more seconds and then we're going to get going no. Okay, let's go. Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to our USPIRE Discovery Day. Um, at USPIRE, we have a vision, and that vision is to enable, bring together a community of the finest commercial leaders in the world. So now you can officially consider yourself part of that community of the finest commercial leaders in the world. So welcome, welcome. Please do make sure you introduce yourselves as we're going through in the chat. It would be amazing to do that. At Uspire, we do three key things. Number one, we run a commercial consulting to help businesses to be the best they can be so that a business can grow as much as possible. The second thing we do is commercial academies for both buying and selling. And I know some of you on the, I'm looking at some faces here on this, uh, on this Zoom today, I've come in through that route, which is fantastic. And then the third thing is that we run something called the USPIRE Network. And the USPIRE Network, again, does three things. It brings together commercial leaders to enjoy keynote speakers from around the world, world-class keynote speakers, as we've become virtual, it's become even more world-class. We also run um, think tanks where we bring, bring our team of members together to think about a problem that needs to be solved in the world and to think about how they're going to approach that within their business. And then finally, commercial coaching. So as commercial chairs, I'm just waving there at Colin, who's there um, in the white jumper. There he is. So Colin is our chairman and one of our key commercial coaches. So I'm also waving at Maliki there. Maliki who's over there in Ireland, who is our uh, Irish commercial coach, and I'm one too. So we do those three things. And part of the value of um, Discovery Days is that, and part of our reason for doing Discovery Days is to introduce you to what it might be like to be part of our network and to introduce you to Uspire, to some of our directors and um, the kinds of things, so see how we roll really. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce you to Mark Francis, who's been gonna be running our session today on how to be absolutely amazing and lead and present with impact. Um, Mark is our director of learning and Mark is, it's fair to say, I, he is a world expert in terms of virtual impact, um, in-person in impact. And I'm gonna hand over to him right now to, to tell you all about what he's gonna be doing. Over to you, Mark. So when Gita, and here she is, was invited to the stage. She walked slowly from her chair and she turned to face the audience and she smiled broadly, as you can see in the photograph. And her smile lit up the room. And it must have been 10 to 15 seconds before she started to speak, but already she'd engaged us. She'd intrigued us. Why isn't she speaking? What's she going to say and do next? And then she said, to the casual unknowing observer, 
my upbringing in Kathmandu, Nepal, may seem ordinary, normal, and safe. But a little bit like this egg. People might see me as small, well-formed, strong, with plenty of growth potential. But I have to say, in many ways, that would have been an illusion about my upbringing. Because rather like this egg, just one thing happened that smashed that illusion. Now, I was in the audience and at least two other people on this uh, webinar were on the audience as well. And the impact that Gita had on us was extraordinary. When she smashed the egg on a table in front of her, the sound was like a, an explosion because she did it with such force. The front row of the audience were probably a meter behind the table, beyond the table that the egg was smashed on, but she smashed it with so much force that fragments hit a number of people uh, in that front row. And what, what happened was everyone in the audience, about 50 or 60 of us, took almost this kind of <gasps> step back physically of shock and surprise in many ways. And interestingly, one of the people in the front row was, was judging the presentations and there he is. And he had a beautiful Italian jacket on at the start of the presentation, but by the end had to take it off. So Gita's story is an interesting one about how to present with impact. And to an extent, I'm gonna take little pieces of what she did and play them to you very overtly so that you're clear about some of the techniques that made that presentation, which by the way, was four and a half years ago, not just extraordinary at the time, but I can remember vividly most of it now. Not just the showmanship of smashing an egg, but also the storytelling. The emotional connection she made with her audience was extraordinary. We were laughing with her, but we were also crying with her. And a theme weaved all the way through the presentation. And we'll talk a little bit about theme in a moment. So how can you be truly at your best when you present? Now, what I'm gonna ask you to do, very self-centered of you now, I want you to be incredibly self-centered. As you listen, as you observe, as you share, because we're gonna ask you in chat to share a few things. I'd like you to capture two things and it's, it's, a, it's a model I use called the oh so model, oh so, right? And it looks like that, oh and so. So it's a simple piece of paper or if you're using iPhones to capture learning, it's create a table like that, oh and so. And the way it works is really simple. When you hear something from me or indeed we share on chat, or I've got two amazing guests after the break who are experts in a couple of areas we're gonna talk about today. If any of that triggers your own reflection and thinks, oh, that, that would be really good. I should do that, that sounds interesting. Then you put it in the O column. So it's the O for that's surprisingly good. That'll be useful for me, capture it. Now the so is the so what? That says, if I've got a bit of an O, what am I gonna do with that? How am I gonna apply that thinking and that insight to something that's valuable for me? Hence my suggestion, be very self-centered about this. This is all about you, how you present your message. So let me give you just an example because I'm gonna refer back to Gita now. One of the things that she did that was incredible, I would summarize with the word poise, poise. She started with incredible poise. So we were transfixed by her and her calmness physically and verbally, incredibly calm, right from the start. Now that's something that I don't see very often when I watch people present. This morning I happened to be with a customer and we were doing presenting with impact as it happens by chance. And one of the presenters was actually excellent. However, 
she was quite naturally like most presentations I see. And that says, when people start to look at you to start presenting, you start speaking straight away. So you get to the point on the stage where you are ready physically, and then you start speaking straight away. That lacks poise. So let's imagine that's one of the things that's already triggering in your O. Poise, that's good. Don't start by just talking fast. Start with some physical presence, and that might mean smile before you speak. So this is the action, smile before you speak, and that's the internal learning. Okay, so that's the oh no, oh so model. So you just use that as you will. But in my experience of listening to people talking about topics like this, there are several moments when you get that oh moment, that aha moment. They say, oh, might try that myself. And without capturing it, what happens is it comes into the front of our brain and disappears quite quickly after the session. So I encourage you to use oh so when you need to, but also I'm gonna mention it a couple of times because it's one of those things where you think, oh, that's good, good idea. And then maybe it skips your mind. On reflection, there are three things in particular on top of storytelling that Gita did that was so impactful in the moment and has left a legacy that I remember what she said. Three things, poise is one. Her physical presence was extraordinary. And Gita, because I asked her, is 1.49 meters tall. That is four foot 11. And so you might have this weird perception that that means you haven't got physical presence. Well, if you have poise, of course you do. It doesn't matter how tall you are. So poise was one that she brought, captivated us before she even spoke. The second thing is surprise. I reckon everything she did in those first 90 seconds was a surprise or indeed shocking. I mean, the egg smashing was truly shocking. But surprise is there as well. I mean, to start with a story is surprising. I reckon 99,000 out of 99,001 presentations I've ever seen start with this. <clears throat> Hello, my name is and the purpose of my presentation is or worse actually, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is. Actually, for those of you who do know me, my name is, but I'm just wasting energy and time and I'm not grabbing your attention from the start. So Gita did that. She did that physically from the start. That was a surprise. The fact that she was gonna tell us about a Kathmandu upbringing was a surprise. I didn't expect her to be from Nepal. I know nothing about Nepalese education or upbringing. And therefore I was intrigued by that. And then of course, there was the eye contact because when she spoke and shared her story, she shared it to her audience as if it was one to one. So that meant when she spoke with emotion, we felt the same emotion. And I did laugh at times and I did cry. Now, not every presentation is about making people that reactive in an emotional way. But if you don't connect emotionally, you might as well just send an email instead of present. If it's just an intellectual information share, I can send you an email or text you. So she surprised us in everything she did and said. And the third thing is theme. Most presentations I see, I don't, I don't get a theme. I don't get a red thread of storyline all the way through. I get a series usually of independent slides which don't flow because there isn't a theme. And as human beings, we need theme to be able to hang our hat on and follow the whole journey. And without saying the theme, Gita established a theme that she reinforced verbally later of inner belief. This point about using an egg, because actually there are many things about an egg that's strong, but also fragile. And when she showed us another egg later on, it was in a different form and wasn't fragile. And so she used the theme of inner belief and reinforced it visually with a hard boiled egg at the end. 
So those are three elements of what she did that were truly extraordinary. And I'm hoping already it's starting to trigger for you and you're thinking there's some O's going on. Not least in some of the examples of what I normally see when people present. And I normally see an individual introduction and a purpose statement. Hello, my name is Mark and I'm gonna to talk to you about. That's what's expected. I think that's how most of us have been trained and it's utterly dull. It's predictable. By the way, I already knew it. I knew your name because I'm going to something that I've already prepared for. So I know your name. Even if I never met you, I know your name. I also know the purpose of the meeting and presentation. Otherwise I wouldn't be there. So all of that stuff that let's face it, all of us, including me, continue to do when we present, just gets in the way of your message. So I'm hoping that some of the elements of the O that you write down are unlearning. Stop doing that. If you don't know me, my name is. <sighs> Please stop doing that. So, oh so. Now, I'm gonna do a little quiz because all of this is about stimulating you. And in this first section, it's mainly me provoking and stimulating. So I'm gonna keep changing how I do that. Otherwise your attention span will drift away. So here's a quiz, answering individually and you score yourself. First question, there are five questions just out of interest, all on the topic of presenting, of course. Question number one, and this is from Amazon. So Amazon survey, and they surveyed business people all over the world. That's what they did. And so there were thousands of people in the Amazon survey and they asked, who has a fear of public speaking? Do you, yes or no? So what percentage of this survey, multiple countries, multiple industries, multiple ages, what percentage said, yeah, you know, I, I, I do fear public speaking. Notice I say public speaking. It's not just presenting. Some people don't mind a small presentation, but public speaking, what percentage of people fear that? So using chat, what percentage of people do you think fear public speaking? Well done, everybody. These are, you're, you're, you're doing really well because these are high numbers and they should be. Yeah, the actual answer is 75%. So three out of four. And that means that on this webinar, there's probably 35, maybe 40 people for whom at some point we fear the thought, let alone the action of public speaking. This is super important because if one aspect of what comes out of today is elements that make you more confident, then I'm doing my job because it's confidence or lack of self-belief. Do you remember Gita's theme, inner belief? The lack of that means that I allow outside events to affect the way I feel. And actually, you're in control of that. So that's question number one, 75%. We're gonna come back to that theme a little bit later on. Question number two, online. Online, what is the length of attention span when you are presenting? So online presentation, which this is, by the way, what's the length of attention span in minutes? Thank you, Conrad, 10, Torben, 15, 27, eight, three, Simon Trainer, four. Oh yes, that's the correct answer. It is four minutes. So my Gita story was less than four minutes. My little bit of setup in terms of the oh so was less than four minutes and the quiz right so we're on the third different thing in a short space of time to keep your attention otherwise i lose it just out of interest face-to-face -face presentation attention is eight minutes so you have twice as long as it's a face-to-face -face audience because they're more connected and engaged it's way harder to be distracted face-to-face -face. not least we can see you playing with your phone, right? Online, you can get away with certain things. So it's half the amount of time, it's four minutes. Next question, and I said I'd come back to this. There is actually an illness about fear of presenting. There's, there's something that it is diagnosable and it's called glossophobia, glossophobia, almost like your eyes gloss over. 
and you're so terrified of presenting to an audience that your brain stops remembering what it was going to say. Glossophobia. What percentage of people suffer from glossophobia? So that's extreme fear of presenting. Extreme fear. What do you think? Using chat. We've got good instincts in this group. It's, it is, it's far less, of course, than the fear of public speaking in general. It's 28%, so about one in four, slightly more than one in four. So again, if it's this audience, it's probably 15 people. Now, the reason I call that out is that it might be you. And if that is the case, then what we're talking about today, elements of what we're talking about, when embraced, will make a huge difference. So one of the things that Gita did, because uh, Peter and I, Peter Cooper's on this call, Peter and I were working with Gita in developing her skills. One of the things she worked on brilliantly was breathing. Now, I know that sounds unbelievably simple, but if you're one of those people that said, I'm in the 75% of a fear of public speaking or in the 28% that said, I'm actually terrified. I don't show it because I'm a professional and I have to present, but I'm petrified by it then actually this matters. Breathing matters. Now, what happens when you are nervous and really nervous, and we've all been there, where we're presenting such an important thing to such a, an important audience in some way that we start to clam up, what happens is our breathing becomes incredibly shallow and short. And what happens is that says to the brain, be nervous, be distracted, and suffer. Our body is saying to our brain, we're extremely uncomfortable, so please get out of here if you can. So how do you avoid that? You breathe more deeply. And so I catch myself doing this when I get more unhealthy nerves than healthy, because there are certain nerves that bring you to your best performance. But when I start to feel a little bit tense, I just breathe deeply in through my nose and out through my mouth. Even if I'm sitting in an audience, I don't do it with any sound, hopefully, but. And what it does is it says to the brain, calm. I'm now feeling calm. So start to calm down, start to be more still, start to panic less. It's an internal system, body and mind, same system. And so breathing says to the brain, I can do this. We're calm. We can present with clarity and impact. So that was an interesting one, wasn't it? There's a very high number of us, one in four who suffer badly from presentation and actually could do with a little bit of help. So hopefully we're gonna start that journey today. Next one's fascinating. There is a a company called TED Talks. It's a company, it's a book, and it's a philosophy of how to present well. So TED Talks, you can usually see it on YouTube. And when it first started, the, the TED Talks tended to be about 30 minutes or so, experts speaking about something that they're experts in. They're really good. And they started to change the rules. One of the rules they changed was the length now cannot be more than 16 minutes. And we know the reason for that. And that's because eight minute attention span. So you've got two sections and you've got two sections only, maximum of eight minutes each. So it follows a, a, a tried and tested pattern, TED Talks. But here's the question, what percentage of TED Talks start with a story? Now, what I mean by that is they don't, they can't start, hello, I'm Mark, let me tell you a story. That's not starting with a story, that's starting with a, hello, I'm Mark, introduction. So starting with a story means, Maria was 15. Gita walked slowly to the stage. The first word is once upon a time. So what percentage? Well then everybody, again, it's unbelievably high. They have changed the rules. So I think it was Felicity Bright who said 100%. The rules now are 100%. If you sign up for a TED talk, you are obliged to start with a story. So it's 100% now. On average, if you go back when, when they first started, it's something like 94% now, on average, uh, start with a story. 
So it is the desired way. Now, that might be something you have never done. I was never trained and I was trained classically in great fast moving consumer goods companies, how to present. And no one ever told me to start with a story. Some people said, be a storyteller conceptually at some point in the presentation, but no one said first word out of your mouth is once upon a time, no one. So it's not been part of my education. It may well may not, not be part of yours. So think about it. Think about it as an option to truly grab attention human to human right at the start. Last question, question number five. In our brains, when we are receiving communication, we have what are called receptors. Receptors in our brain that cover all of the senses that are receiving information. So what percentage of the receptors in our brains are visual? What percentage of the receptors in our brains of all of the information we're getting, which is sight and sound and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's high again, well done everybody, it is high. It's, it's surprisingly high. Most people are not high enough in the percentages. I'm seeing 60, 65, 80 from Pete Butterworth. It's 90. It's 90. Now, if, if we did stop this session now, or you left it right now, if the only thing you take away, digest and do something about, it's 90%. 90%. So when I described oh so, if I just talked it, it would have had nowhere near as much power as, as showing you and showing you how to fill it in. Nowhere near as much. And by the way, that's a visual. I could have written the word smile, but that has more impact on your receptors than the word smile. So this becomes a major challenge to us as presenters, major, because how do we currently do it? And I'm going to provoke you a lot now. How do you currently do it? Well, most of us, including me, when I uh, don't think about it or when I'm forced to by my client, we put words on slides. We put words on slides. Can you believe it? We put words on slides. And then when we're talking, people are reading the slides. Now that's, I think, I think laughably they're called visual aids. They're not visual. They're just words on a slide which are a distraction actually from the verbal and body language message the presenter is giving. So this is, this is important. 90% of the receptors in our brains are visual. So in lockdown, unbelievably, I learned to cook. It was about time, about time I pulled my finger out and supported the family more than I was. How did I learn to cook? I just got videos on YouTube from chefs saying, this is how you cook that, and this is how you cook that, and this is how you peel an onion. And I learned unbelievably quickly because they were visual. Yes, they, they told me what to do, but I actually copied what I saw because that's how our brain works. So if you want to impact your audience, get more visual. And that means use your body differently as well. Even online, you can use your body differently. And we're going to talk a lot more about that as we go through. So I'm hoping that the osos for you personally are starting to fill up. And you don't have to do both at the same time. You can do a list of O's and at the end think, what are my so's? <laughs> what are my so was? Okay. Now, let me introduce you to these two messages because this is the frame of everything we're going to talk about. I'm going to bring them to life. And I'm going to explain the approach to brilliant presentation, because if you follow these four steps, your presentation will be, well, maybe as good as Gita's, because this is what Gita did. Now, where does it come from? A colleague of ours, brilliant, brilliant theatre director, writer, author, uh, organisational psychologist, Liz Margri. Look the name up. Absolutely brilliant presentation coach specialist Liz and I got together eight years ago and between us when our different experience from business world theater world we said what does it take so that you get to the point of 
landing your message, be it on stage or in a business meeting, with incredible clarity, incredible connectivity with the audience, and which inspires the audience to do something that you want them to do. What approach do you have to take? And it's those four steps. It took us ages to agree that, I reckon two days. And we tried, tried it and tested it over the last eight years and it's still pretty strong. I'll, I'll talk more about it in a moment. Then this is the other one and, and Amanda, Chester, Peter, all of my colleagues, Malachi, all of us, we, we use this. We use this because this is a brilliant provocation actually from what you might be doing now to what you could be doing next and better. And it's this, ABCD, ABCD. And of course it's easy to remember, which helps. ABCD, what tends to happen when someone says, could you present? Could you present for me on the topic of whatever it is? Our whole instinct, education, background, culture, expectation is, well, what am I gonna say? What, what information do I need to share? What's the content of my presentation? So we go C first. We go C first and then we go D. And actually sometimes we go D then C, D being the delivery method. Right, I'll get my computer open. I'll get into PowerPoint, which is a delivery method. And then I'll think what slides content shall I put together? Now, I hope after a little bit of explanation, you'll see why that's so flawed. Now, what if this is a better way, a better, better mentality is to start with A and then B. What does the A stand for? Using chat, what does the A stand for? It's the first thing you should think about. Des Harney, right on the money, straight in. I don't mind ask actually, that's not a bad one, it's connected. Audience is the right answer, well done, Simon. Yeah. It's audience, and by the way, ask the audience is not a bad one. So we, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with that as well. So A is for audience. Now, I am gonna ask you in chat to, to think about this for a while. What do you need to do when you think about audience? What are the elements you should be thinking about if you start with audience rather than content? Rather than what am I gonna say? Who am I saying it to? Great start, Mark. What's in it for them? Brilliant. What else? Put in chat now. What should you be considering when you're thinking about your audience? Benefits, level of detail like that. What do they already know? Brilliant one. Why are they there? Fundamentally, why are they there? What, them, what do you want them to do? Pain points. Good one, Bertrand. Pain points. Yes. Thank you for all these elements in chat. Notice there's quite a lot. So if I'm spending all of my time thinking about what am I gonna say, I don't have any time to think about my audience. I'm not doing all of these things particularly well. Amanda's put style preference and in a way it's a summary of some of the things that others have said here. How do they communicate? What is their natural style? What is their personality type? Do they want me to go into detail? Are they detail orientated? Do they bring blue energy? Or are they kind of headline and get to the point? If it's a small audience, you can actually decide for every member what style should you adopt to connect. But notice there's a lot to think about. And here's the other thing to think about, which again may break a paradigm that's in your brain, is if you're presenting broadly the same thing to a number of different audiences, right? So let's imagine you're a marketing person, you're, you're head of a number of brands, and you're doing a brand presentation. You're presenting the strategy for your brands, first of all, to your own board members, the leadership team in your own company. Then you're presenting it to the next level down. Then you're presenting it to the sales force. So you've got a number of different audiences, same content. Here's the thing about this. I've seen this so often. We get the same presentation. We get the same presentation. You've designed it. You've designed it once. You've presented it once. It went down well. Right. I'm just going to do that again and again and again. And it's flawed. It's flawed, isn't it? It's fundamentally flawed because that changes every time. Every single time you present, how should I present to that audience? What do they want? What do they already know was a brilliant point in chat. 
what do they ordinary or already know? Every audience, it'll be different, the answer. What's their preference style? Here's another couple of things. What time of the day is it? What time of the day is it? That affects how much I share and how I share it. So got to consider that. What time of the day for the audience? We do a lot of work uh, multinationally and absolutely. We have to check ourselves when it's morning here and we're working with colleagues in Japan and we don't go good morning, we go good evening because that's their language, that's their time. So audience, audience first. I'm hoping that's something that you are already reflecting on and continue to do. So if Gita did that presentation again, she might choose to use the egg. She might, because it was unbelievably relevant to a theme and it had impact. But she might choose a different style, depending on the audience. Now, the B is, for me, hugely, hugely valuable as a presenter, because what the B is, is behavior. What do you want them to do during your presentation? Now, notice, I'm going to say those words again. It's really important. What do you want them to do? What behaviors do you want to inspire in them while you're presenting? Now, I'm not sure Gita wanted all of these behaviors, but I can tell you some of them. Notice some of them are physical, right? Smile is a behavior. Here's one of the ones she got fairly early on. Right, that's a behavior. Open mouthed shock, right? <laughs> that's the impact you want. How do you do it? Notice how that works. Because we're going down here now. How do I do that? What do I need to share? How do I need to share? It depends on the behavior I want to inspire. Now, behavior during. So in chat, what are the simplest behaviors you want to inspire when you're presenting an important presentation? Smile is one example, right? What else do you want your audience to do if the, if the presentation is super important? Using chat, please. Engage, and engage could be lean forward, show engagement, listen. Interaction's a massive one. Do you want them to ask questions? Positive affirmation. Simon's a really good one that, that could be nodding, right? I want them to nod. Humor, yeah, I want them to laugh. I want them to take notes. A brilliant one, Briggy, yeah. Aha, <laughs> yeah, you might want them to say something as well, right? And that's the point, interaction, we've said. You might want interaction. What does that look like? Is that clapping at certain moments of, of your brilliance? Notice that's a simple behavior. But if you don't plan for that, then you don't shape how you deliver against the behavior. So you need to know those behaviors. And uh, in training a fairly young marketer this morning, I asked her the question, what reaction do you want from your audience? And she said, I want them to sit forward. I said, that's, that's a pretty good one. And why do you want that? So that they're showing that they're engaged. Okay, that's pretty cool. They're a very senior audience, remember? So they might be, um, how can I best describe it? Calm and cool and may, might not sit forward. So what are you gonna do in your style of delivery that makes them that engaged? So notice how that works. Now, what do you want them to do after your presentation? It's a big question, isn't it? What do you want them to do afterwards? Because if Gita wanted me to remember her presentation four and a half years later, she succeeded. If Gita wanted me to tell Gita's story afterwards, she succeeded. See what I mean? You need to think about that. You need to decide it. And then you need to shape your story, content and style to get the behaviors you're looking for. Now, again, that's, that, that might be challenging the way you normally do things. Because as experts in your field, you're naturally going to go here first. What do I know that I want to share? That is natural step one, but it should be step three. And I hope that in sharing and bring it to life a little bit, I'm inspiring you to think this way because it changes fundamentally how you present. So a couple more things for me. We're going to take a break in 12 minutes because I'm conscious that this is quite a lot. And it's one style, really. It's me sharing. So I need to, to keep my energy relatively high because you're static. So could everyone stand up for me just for a moment? And all I want you to do, if you can, by the way, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Lovely jumper. 
Stand up if you can. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Well done, Natalie. Middle of the night. Thank you. I'm just checking you haven't gone to sleep and got matchsticks keeping your eyes open. Thank you. And now all I want you to do is imagine you are super excited about a presentation either that you're going to make or you've just made and it was brilliant. And you're so excited, you rub your hands together. And I just want you to do that for 10 seconds. Rub your hands together with excitement. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. It's really exciting, right? Like we do. Oh, I can't wait. Can't wait. Fantastic. So great stuff. Grab a seat. You, you might be breathing a little bit faster. What's definitely happened is that the blood flow in your system is moving. And that's a stimulation, right? That's really important because as I keep talking, yeah, and warmer hands, but trying as well. Yeah, <laughs> hot hands. Um, what I'm hoping is that it's, it's continually demonstrating that if I just kept talking, even if it's quite interesting stuff, your brain waves and your intake is dropping. That's the way it works. So I'd like to talk to you a bit more about this. Get set. Get set includes A and B, right? But it's also very much about getting yourself set. Geeing yourself up if you need to. You know, what do I need to do to get this message across? How do I influence in advance? How do I want to come across? What's my end goal? That's all in get set. But notice I put the A and the B here. Of course, that frames everything in your get set. Self-reflection and the A and the B. So that's get set. Write your story. Liz and I, we must have spoken about this for hours. We we're saying, please be a storyteller. When you present, please be a storyteller. Even if you don't have the desire or boldness or will to go right from the start of your presentation with a story, put some story in it. So the more we talked about it, the more we said, we have to have the word story in an approach and it's right your story. So write your story, write a relevant story, write their story. It's your audience. It's, I, might, I might reflect back their story back to them. That might be appropriate. Yep, might do that. So story write, not just a series of PowerPoint slides. That's not a story. That's an information dump. So write your story. Next, practice. Now, herein lies a challenge for all of us, because, again, the way I was taught to practice is wrong. I was taught to practice, and I've done this more times than I care to mention, start to finish. Start to finish, right? And what happens is it becomes an enormous mental challenge. I've got 45 minutes, and I'm practicing for all 45 minutes again and again, and getting more and more concerned I'm forgetting bits, which I am. And then when it comes to the actual presentation, I definitely forget bits because I've practiced the whole thing. Now, this is where Liz said, well, you've got to follow what we do in the theater. And that is you chunk your practice. You just chunk it and you practice sections and you practice triggers in those sections so that you can isolate them, be amazing at them, and then do another chunk. And we do a lot of work of first 30 seconds. So Gita is a glorious example of someone who did everything we talked about how did she get poise? She was breathing in the, in the aisles before she was brought in, <sighs> saying, oh, I'm calm, <sighs> I smile. So she was doing all of that so that the first 30 seconds, she had a spellbound. So practice purposefully, practice smart, but don't practice too much, otherwise it becomes less authentic. Final part, be yourself. Now, Liz insisted this was the final part because truly brilliant presenters present as if it's one-to-one. -one. If it's, I'm just chatting to you as if we were yeah. unencumbered by another audience, just you and me. And therefore, I'm completely natural, normal, and authentic. So be yourself is a critical element of truly br brilliant presentation. Otherwise, your audience feel awkward for you. Otherwise, your audience just feel awkward for you. It's like, oh, he's not comfortable, is he? Oh, I'm not comfortable watching him being not comfortable. Or he's too slick. It's too word for word perfect. And there's no humility. And yet, one-to-one, -one, this guy's quite nice. But actually, when he's speaking, I don't even like him. So I've got six more minutes. 
Are there any questions before the break, by the way, are there any questions that you would like to ask about either of these two things? Anything you didn't understand, anything you wanted to build on yourselves? And you can do that in chat. Are there any questions of understanding or perspective that you would like to ask me about these two things? Mark, can you see the chat? I can, yeah, I'm seeing it. How to slow down. Amanda, I'd love to know what you mean by number presentations. You mean that the the number of presentations when you got? No, work? I mean when you know when you're doing a boring spreadsheet presentation, whether it's for oh, a yes. budget or something like that. That you know, yes, I might be passionate about it, and other folk are just looking to cook the books. <laughs> That's and a brilliant one. I'll, I'll pick that one up, actually, Amanda. Um, Actually, Amanda and I, so Amanda Downs and I were, were in a session where the finance director presented to his leadership team and he made sure the chairs were in a circle and he actually did a timeline on the floor and he moved to represent profit in and profit out. And it was visually stunning. There were, although there could have been spreadsheets, he used them as handouts, not a present, presentation. And it was an unbelievably memorable presentation and educational. So it's, it's, it's force yourself to be creative is the perspective I'd give, I'd give on that. Force yourself to be creative. Thank you. Let's have a look at some of these others. Oh, there's a brilliant one from Simon. Uh, how do you manage slides when the audience is conditioned to receiving PowerPoint, especially virtually? Huge point. I, Amanda and I are not using slides. We could do, we've got some slides in backup if we needed them, but we're not. And that's a deliberate choice. Simon's point is, and I've seen this with one of our clients in Australia, the chief exec said, I want you to present on slides and here is the format. So notice how restricting that is, must be PowerPoint and you must use the following format. Slide one is an introduction, slide two. And I said, well, what can you do to um, make sure you do that and apply all of these principles? And one of the, uh, it was the best presentation I thought, um, one of the leaders who's, who's uh, head of their hospitality unit, uh, she's brilliant by the way, she said, here's the presentation in advance, sent a detailed slide-based presentation in advance, and in the actual presentation didn't present it. So I know it sounds simple, but find a way to keep everyone in your audience happy, because the CEO is an important member of that audience. Let's have a look at some of the others here. Uh, presentation through teams where they give you the subject yeah yeah again notice how we've we're going to do breakout at the end of the second session but variety remember four minutes of attention so keep changing the dynamic we did a quiz earlier i'm using chat quite a lot to keep you you, you entertained or interested what do you do when you start to stutter uh, breathe nisha I, I've been there. I, I was very dyslexic when I was younger, and sometimes that made me lack confidence and stutter, particularly when I was reading. And I taught myself to stop, breathe, gather, and go again. It's really tough, that. Uh, take down notes, interaction, blah, blah, blah. right, here we go. I'm just looking at all of these, some great ones here, thank you. Chunking practice from Des. Yes, borrowed from, from actors. Uh, find people some clash between practice and authentic. Really good one, Steve, here. So how much practice do you do? How much practice do you do? And um, Gita's story I practiced. So I told you Gita's story, but I practiced that because there were certain things I wanted to get exactly right, certain words. So I, I was very rigorous in practicing that. And this morning I did it to myself and then I did it on screen. So I practiced the physical uh, storytelling as well and that was until about an hour ago and then I thought I don't want to over practice now I've got to do something I've got to change my state otherwise I'll get it won't sound authentic so I went for a run it's a beautiful day here and when I came back not only was my head clear it was also clear about how I was going to tell the Gita story so find your way of practicing where it actually adds value but doesn't increase the tension the more you practice you're so over practiced it sounds like you're a robot Avoid that if you can. 
Okay, team. So I'm going to give one last input and then I'm going to give you a 10 minute break. The last input is about how you show up online and it's around about behaviors. So this is what, what do you want to inspire in your audience? Throughout this session, I've been looking at a little dot in my camera, which is exactly at eye level. So as I speak, I'm forcing myself to speak in there so that my eyes go straight into your eyes. That's a factor of impact online. It's essential, although it's a new skill. In fact, our whole instinct, I've got images of people I, I really like and care about. So Malachi is bottom right of my screen. And I'd rather talk to my friend Malachi because he'll smile at me and make me feel comfortable. But look how ineffective it is at speaking to you now. I'm enjoying it because Malachi's smiling, right? And I'm smiling back, it's lovely. Yeah, but I've lost impact with you. So I've just got a visual. We, we use flame. We love to use words that help remember. And flame is brilliant impact online. Get your frame right. So I am three quarters of the way up. I am about a meter, just slightly less than a meter from that camera. So not too close, but not too far. And that's frame. Lighting, yes, I have five different lights to make sure this looks relatively full face clear. Audio, I've got the buds in, so I'm not speaking too loud, which is one of my horrible traits. Land your message, that's a natural one. And here's the interesting thing, energy. What we mean by energy is understand that your energy transfers through the screen. So I have a natural yellow energy, particularly when I'm standing up, which is enthusiastic, lots of physical movement, smiling as I speak. And actually to an audience online, that's important even if it isn't natural for you, because I need to be on show. Because if I'm not, you'll start to lose your energy. So bring the right level of energy so that you connect to a big audience, but also you stay connected one-to-one. -one. So uh, think about flame. By all means, if you want to, you can check how you're coming over now. Is your face beautifully lit? Are you eye level, all of those things? So that when we come back after the break, you look even better than you did before we even started. So the time now is two minutes plus 52 minutes past if you are in Europe or the US. 52 minutes past. So can we come back at two minutes past the hour, please, which is 10 minutes. Energized, blood flowing, drinks, anything you need to do. See you in 10 minutes. And we've got two amazing guests to join us for the C and the D. See you then. And Neil, you join us perfectly because we're just restarting. Everyone's rejoining. So thank you both to Neil and Claire for joining us on the session. It's great to see you. And as everyone else joins, I'm going to just remind everyone of this. If you spotlight me again briefly, Amanda, this idea of as we share, if there are any elements that we that capture our imagination, we think, yeah, that's something I should think about. It's in the O column. And what am I going to do about it is in the so what column. So just to remind you of that, we're at that lovely stage of ABCD when we've talked about put yourself in the shoes of your audience and how do you want them to behave during and after your presentation before you think about content. And I thought it'd be brilliant to get someone who is a professional content expert, and that is Claire Winter to join us. And then after we've spoken to Claire, we're gonna to speak to someone who is a professional deliverer of content actor, comedian, writer, professional on stage deliverer to say, give us some tips about the D of ABCD. And that is Neil Malarkey. So I'm delighted that Claire and Neil are with us. Claire, thank you for joining us. And if you could spotlight Claire for me, Amanda, thank you. Now, there's a couple of things you do, Claire, that um, I, inspires me and inspires us at Uspire. We've had the great pleasure of having you as a consultant for our content. So hence why it's, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. A couple of things you're doing I'd love you to talk about first before we say, give us some tips on content. One is you, you help advise businesses and individuals on their content and what to do. One of the bits of advice you gave lately, which I loved was helping, how do you get people onto a podcast as a guest and then impress audiences. I love that one. So get yourself on something you care about, but yeah. then be impressive. I love that. The other thing you're doing is, or thinking about is walking and writing. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That sounds fascinating. Well, um, I guess this is a nice lead into 
create some content that's surprising. So I'm pretty sure that everyone on this call wasn't expecting us to leap into walking and writing. Um, it's a passion of mine. I'm sure many of you went on lots of walks during the last 18 months when we were at home. And instead of doing international travel, you were taking calls while you were walking. Um, but there is um, a great study by Stanford University that says that walking outside in nature and boost your creative output. So I've come up with this idea to get um, hybrid teams together to walk, talk and create great content together to, to, to bring that back to um, businesses. And also if we do go into another lockdown, obviously it's safe because we're outdoors in nature. Um, so um, it's a new idea. Um, so thank you for um, asking me about it. Yeah, pleasure. Really exciting. Really exciting. And that's, so it sounds like that's create your business strategy could be the writing or it could be write a book. It could be as broad as that. Yeah. Sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. So now content. We have, we have, we've thought about our audience. We've put ourselves in their shoes. We've decided our goal, what they expect, and we've created clarity of behavior we want to influence. What's your headline advice about how do we then go about creating impactful content? Yeah, so I think it's thinking about the core bits of content you want to create for your business or personal brand, depending whether you're a consultant or a business. It's um, what content you're going to cre create that's going to drive traffic back to your website. So I'd say blogging is um, so those pillars. So really deciding like um, the key things that I do are blogging and podcasting. Um, I've got a podcast called Cracking Content. So I get great guests on there. Um, so you also reach other people's audiences so they share the, the podcast with them as well but again the blogging will drive traffic back to your website I mean many of you probably only use LinkedIn but if you use Facebook or Instagram as part of your business obviously the, re the recent outage has made people think wow what would happen if all social media failed so what would happen if you lost all your connections on LinkedIn are they all on your email list are you driving traffic back to your website via your blog and the content that you're creating and are you creating thought leadership that are making people go wow that article on linkedin can you be a guest on my podcast are people reaching out to you to speak on stages are they reaching out to your business to contribute as a, a guest blogger um, or content or something like that so for me it's always about what piece of core content are you going to start with um, what what does your organization or you as a personal brand like to create and what's the biggest impact you can do with that. And then obviously we use social media to amplify it rather than relying on social media to drive traffic to it. And so you mentioned cracking content, which is one of your brands, isn't it? Yeah. Cracking content. Give us a flavor of what makes content itself cracking in your terms. I think it's something that makes you stop and listen. It may or, or, or stop and watch something because, you know, we're habitual scrollers, aren't we? You're on LinkedIn. Um, people are sharing all sorts of things. You know, what's going to stop and make you actually read that that post or read that article or watch that watch that video or, or sign up for that webinar? You know, presenting with impact. I mean, how, you know, we're sick of Zoom. If, if we can have someone like you teach us how to present in a better way, you know, people are going to sign up for that. Look how many people are on this call. Um, you know, so it is, it's like, you know, how are you going to um, crack people's interest, you know, like grab their attention. And I, and, you know, sometimes that's being controversial. You know, I always say to people when we start working together, you know, what do you stand for? But what do, what do you stand against? You know, it's, you know, start, you know, there's nothing wrong with starting an argument on social media, you know, in the best possible way. But, you know, believe in something, have something that you stand for um, and make people have a conversation about it, engage them. You know, we're using social media to connect with people and we want conversations with them. So what is going to create conversation? It's not just saying something bland and boring, is it? No, it's not. So how do you how do you get the, the content right in terms of quantity? And I'll give you an example that I mentioned earlier. I see so many business presentations and a vast majority of the people on this call are business leaders. Uh, I see so many presentations where there's just too much stuff. Yeah. You know, there are 30 PowerPoint slides with all of the information we might need. And it's overwhelming and actually dull. 
how do you get the quantity right in, in a content piece? Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, we're, you know, everyone's different types of learners, aren't they? But when you're, when you're with slides, I think um, great images and less words, actually, even though I'm all about the words and wanting to help people make their words come alive. It's less words and less slides, isn't it? And it's what you say. It's how, you know, what, how you make people think, like you've given people an action with your, uh, you know, with the so, um, you know, you're getting people to think about um, what you're saying and interact and, and get them involved. If you if you put out a PowerPoint with 30 slides in it, pe you're going to lose people. And if they're text heavy, you're going to you're going to lose people quickly and you're going to see them turn off their cameras. Um, you're going to see them start looking down and you like you've lost them, haven't you? Now, a, a, a tip from you, Claire, if there's someone on this uh, webinar who has never really done some of the things you've mentioned. So that was me, by the way, 18 months ago. Blog, never, you know, yeah. podcast, never. And then I decided to do 25 of them, you know, it's like, Whoa, go for it. <laughs> What's your advice to those who, who intellectually would get it? Do you know what I mean? Yes, it's good to get your content out there smartly with edge, be provocative. It all sounds good. How, what's your advice about how to start if you're not naturally one of those people? I think think about the way that you want to communicate. Um, are you good on camera? So that's video. Do you, you know, are you better speaking at, like are you a natural speaker podcast are you a writer start with the blogging for sure so I've had I've worked with people who are excellent presenters like yourself and they might not have the time to write so we'd start with the podcast we'd map out six weeks worth of content and then they'd get sent to something like rev.com or you can use the free software otter.ai to transcribe the podcast and get a copywriter or someone in your team to make it into a blog so then you've also got it as a blog as well. So that's one way of doing it. So maybe think about the content that you like, that you think that you would like doing the best. So it might just, you know, start with writing a blog about something you're passionate about, something that you're, that, that you're doing differently in business to anyone else um, and get that out in, you know, you can get it out as an article on LinkedIn. I'd always say publish it on your own website first, but, you know, um, but get it out there. Yeah. Thank you, that's awesome. And I'm gonna invite people, I've got one more question for you, Claire, but I'm gonna invite anyone who has questions for Claire to use chat for me. And, uh, oh, there's a question in there. Is there a maximum number of sides in a 30 minute, 60 minute presentation? Um, it's interesting because it depends on your audience, as we've said before, Amanda. Uh, the key for me is that if you have a slide, it should always have two minutes associated with it. So in a presentation for an hour, 30 slides doesn't work because you've got start, you've got finish, you've got people arriving late, you've got questions, you've got interference, you've got technical issues. So be really, really brutal. If you've got 60 minutes, I think 10 slides is probably maximum if indeed you decide to use slides. But if anyone has a question for Claire, please use chat. I'm just looking at it now. So if you have any questions, please use chat to ask them. Claire, final question from me. If I wanted to go bigger with content and be bolder, some of the things you've said, you know, be edgy, be a little bit disruptive. How do you help me over the line if, if, a little, if people are a little bit like me where there is a kind of element of conservatism? How do you help us be bolder with content? Any tips on that? I think start with stories. You know, there's a reason why we sat around campfires thousands of years ago and told each other stories, you know. so you know, start with your story, you know, why, why do you do what you do? Why, why, is, why has your business evolved the way it has? And, you know, you're particularly good at this, telling anecdotes around people that you've helped in your business and people that have influenced the way that you do business. I think that they will, all, people love to hear stories and I think finding different ways of telling them. And um, I know you've done this like short clips of video that will just grab people's attention and then you can draw their attention to a longer bit of content that works really well. Again, podcasts for people that are on their dog walks that they can listen and learn while they're doing other things or they might be doing something as mundane as stacking the dishwasher. But, you know, it's something that they can do whilst they're doing something else. And I think that's what's so brilliant about podcasting brilliant thank you thank you claire well we've got the option of the chat to come in come back in and i can come back to you it's a lovely segue into neil malarkey because 
content richness that you describe and going for it. I think that boldness of choose whichever methodology, but go for it uh, to get your content out there. It then becomes, how do you deliver it? So it's the D of ABCD, it's deliver. And the reason I'm so thrilled that Neil is with us is the first time I ever, I didn't meet Neil, I saw him was on stage at the comedy store. And he did two things that day that were brilliant. One was interactive comedy. So the audience is adding value to the comedy and very, very much involved. So that was brilliant. Then there was a, a solo piece with a particular character that Neil does on his stage performance that was just, well, for me, it was brilliant. So very different style of delivery. And Neil is an actor, a comedian, was a founding member of the Comedy Store. And still, I think, you are you still there today, Neil? Or were you there this morning, Comedy Store? Um, actually, I was coaching there this morning, but I performed there every Sunday with the Comedy Store players doing improv. And uh, so we're there every, we're actually doing Shakespeare's Globe on the 25th of October and under 18s are allowed, if that helps. Oh, fantastic. Learn. Normally, normally children or younger people aren't allowed. So yes, I do improv, but I also, I've done plays where I've had to learn my lines as well. These are slightly different things. Brilliant. Uh, can you, first of all, before we go into the detail of how do you show up so brilliantly to deliver, because that's the essence of what we're hoping to do in the D of ABCD is, when you come to share content, you're at your visual and, and communicative best. Before we go into that, tell me a little bit about how it is to be an actor who is a performer entertainer through this pandemic, because there was an incredibly long time when you couldn't do a lot of the things you just described of being at the comedy store with an audience. How's that been for you as an entertainer this, this recent times? Well, March the 15th, 2020 was the last time we did the Comedy Store Players. Then we reopened this July. So there was a very long period where the stage was not an option. And I realized, and other comedians are right, it's not just the money. There's something about us. We need that interaction. But I very quickly, and this is going to be helpful to people, I very quickly realized you can do the stuff on Zoom as well. Claire's just talked to us about it. The voice, the written word, uh, the vlog, uh, we can still make this medium work for us. And the first thing, I think, Mark, you look like you're standing up. You look, is that am, right? Absolutely, yes. And I asked somebody in March 2020, am I allowed to stand up on a Zoom call? And they said, oh, I, don't, I don't see why not. And I started trying it and I felt I could become the performer I am on stage on Zoom because you can still bring energy. And I'm deliberately trying to animate the screen. And I now when I coach people, I say, stand up. Uh, you see people on the phone in the street going, and you can see their body is helping their voice. So for me, it was three weeks of, oh no, what am I going to do in March 2020? And I got lots of friends and I asked their advice and I found people were really open to help. And this is a bigger thing to ask everyone. Ask people for help. Everybody wants to help. Um, and so they would come along, I'd do some pilots. Uh, I would with some learning and development types and various people said this, that and the other. Somebody said, why not color code your bookshelves? So I did. Um, I started noticing not everyone was using slides. So isn't it great to see real things when you held up? Oh, so isn't it just great to have um, something three dimensional? And this is a particularly good picture of my book available on Amazon and Kindle. It's just things like using the depth of field. So bringing yeah. energy and bringing fun. And although my job is as a com comedy performer, teaching improv, we can do this in every business meeting, a bit of social, a bit of fun, acknowledging, yes, it isn't face to face, but actually I can see your face better than I might be able to in a meeting. Let's use the chat. Thank you, Claire. Use the chat for fun, for questions, for references. So use this medium. Is it, That's what I basically found. And within a few months, I was as busy as ever on Zoom, although I still love being with an audience. And ever since July, it's just been wonderful because the audience is there. Thank goodness you're here. We do like that shared experience. Nothing can replace it. However, isn't it great? I can do a gig, you can do a gig, and there's people in Australia and Vietnam and the West Coast of America and North Europe and South Africa. Isn't it great we can play and do things with people in any time zone? 
Yeah, that's one of the things I love is that we, we're doing work actually with people in several time zones all at the same time by being about lunchtime and trying to get everyone in that time frame. I'd love you to talk about, I got a piece of feedback once that said, Mark, when you're scripted, you're professional, but when you go spontaneous, you're impactful. So stop being so scripted. It was brilliant advice. And I've probably gone too far the other way now. But um, <laughs> when, you, when you mentioned improv, it, it's that, isn't it? It's in the moment you are delivering and expressing yourself. What tips would you give those of us who are not professionals at improv? Because you've been on Whose Line It Is Anyway, all of those brilliant programs. What are your top tips for being spontaneous when you are presenting? Practice it. So, so Mark, you've practiced this and you also kind of know where you're going. You've got a rough idea where it is. So you've got a structure, but you know within that you can muck about a bit and you don't know what I'm going to say. You don't know how long I'm going to go on. You might have to shut me up. Uh, but most people are scared of improv because they think it sounds like you've got to be funny. And you don't have to be funny. You can be funny, but the main rule of improv counterintuitively is to listen. What she said, what's being given you by this person, by this audience, what's not being said, how can you use that to pick up? So it's just being aware more of external stimuli than going inside too much. So when you're making a presentation, I think you should practice. I think you should build in moments where there is interaction, but you know how to come back for it. It could be just who here loves Microsoft Teams breakout rooms? Um, who's Who's got iPhone 12? Who's got a dog? Just It could be just a hand up, but it just means you get some sort of interaction, some sort of life, uh, and you can do that on Zoom or anything. So um, it's, it's great that somebody said you're impactful, but you sort of have to practice because a lot of people think, oh, I don't know what to say, but I would say too often people have written a script or somebody in their team has written it for them. And all they're thinking about, I must get their words right. And I sound a little bit like I am reading out my essay for the teacher in the third form. And uh, goodness me, Des Harney's from a long time ago. I used to do a double act with Nick Hancock. Initially, we were called Bleep and Booster. A hundred years ago, yes, Des. Um, thank you. But that was a very scripted show. I did a show with Mike Myers that was very scripted. And there's a real joy in rehearsing and getting right something that is scripted. And there's a different kind of joy doing something with improv. And I would say most presentations, workshops, interactions, be great to have a bit of both. A bit of, I know what I'm gonna say here, I've written it and I've got it, Claire Winter has written me some great content or I've used her methods to, to really nail a message that's not waffly and is concise. And then I can pepper that with moments of real interaction. That's, that's the golden mix, I would say. There's something you said there, and, and, and I'm going to say it again, because I think it's so powerful. You plan for interaction sections. And I, I think if I, if I was true to myself, I've never done that. I do it, but it's unplanned. You know, and I, and I think, well, if we run over, we run over. But actually planning out, this is the moment when I'm going to say hands up if, and I'm going to get interaction, and that might take five minutes. So I've got a five minute improv in your language section and I, it doesn't matter where that goes uh, i need to facilitate it i think that's brilliant because one of the things we said at the start what what are the important things in terms of what you want the audience to do one of the big ones was engage and interact we'll plan that and practice it i think that's very very powerful yeah because um i think it's worthwhile just saying i've got five minutes here it maybe it runs seven or it runs two because nobody puts their hand up. But um, timing is, is good to, to, to work out in advance, especially on a Zoom thing when our attention span is quite different. So I've attended a few things by light bulb moment who are really good virtual classroom facilitators and they spread the joy beautifully. They give advice, they share different platforms. But things like they've even got a template for how to do it. You know, there's one minute here. This is the slide. There's two minutes there. That kind of thing. You may play with it, but it sort of gives you a chance because otherwise you end up um, half an hour in and you've got four hours material left or you end up with nothing left and you've got to just listen to me for half an hour. So you want to be able to have a little bit of planning and a little bit of spontaneity. Thank you, Neil. One of the things you do and you've, you've done for us brilliantly is facilitate a conference. 
and we've got some business leaders who will be planning conferences in, in the next few months. What advice would you give? Because I've seen you do it, but I'd love you to share it. What advice would you give to make a conference, not just 10 presentations with a facilitator saying, oh, thank you for that, it was really good. And here's the next one. How do you make conferences really special? Don't have too much content. Make every speaker a short presentation. Have multiple speakers, five minutes here, five minutes there. I saw a wonderful thing by Deloitte where people had a minute and a half and there'd be somebody saying, in lockdown, I've learned German. Uh, in lockdown, I've learned to dance. Um, I I'm from a diverse community and this is what we're doing. There's all sorts of things to say. And of course it had to be run, run tightly. There was an MC and stuff, but just get many voices, throw in a few videos, get as much interaction as possible, get people to load up pictures. Um, and then um, there are lots of companies that do that. So they've, they've used Zoom or something else. So um, open audience is one. I've done a yes, they're brilliant. Of them. And, and they, you can literally, they've worked out, you can get phone, here's me by, by the back door in the tea break, and they can upload it. Or they can, uh, they can do questions and answers really quickly. Uh, there's things like Slido, Minto. Use as much as you can of the interactive software. Change the dynamic. Have music in the intervals. Have somebody like Mark Francis uh, in between rather than just here's the CFO, here's the CMO, here's the CEO, here's the state of the nation. Now here's a slide and it's some busy slide. Cut down everything to no more than, I don't know, 10 minutes. But actually uh, what I read is that our attention span now is about five minutes. Yeah, so we were saying, about yeah. five minute episodes, really. Episodes is another one in terms of planning and writing and structuring is have clear episodes. I talked about chunking your practice as well in that in that guise. So I'd like to come back to the intensely personal now in terms of we shared earlier on, Neil, before you joined us, that three three out of four of us have a fear of public speaking. Now, you're the obverse of that. You embrace it. In fact, you've missed it and you love it. So what's your tip when the spotlight is on and actually our body is telling our brain, get out of there, hearts <laughs> racing, sweating. <sighs> what are your tips to, to alleviate that, to embrace it, to, to, to optimize the opportunity in the spotlight? Well, I don't not fear it. I respect the stress it brings. So I manage the stress. I love, obviously, the audience laughing with me. I love them being moved if I'm in a play. So I like that, but I know it brings enormous stress. And one thing I would say to everybody is prepare your body. So things like get to the event early, don't have back-to-back -back meetings, put on a different shirt, allow yourself, um, I'm, I'm not, not sure I can deal with that one. <laughs> uh, I think I'm Amanda. Um, get yourself in the zone. Too many people saying, yeah, I'm presenting at five o'clock. What are you doing before that? I've got back to back. Give yourself an hour beforehand to not do anything. Have a bath, have a sleep, have a walk, have a cake, and then a break afterwards. Too often I see people kind of just giving 50% because they know they got the rest of the day. It's funny how the feedback you get. So often in a workshop, I'll say, well, after this, I'm going to go and have a lie down. And then in a three and a half hour workshop, this person said, that's all I remember. You're going to have a lie down. But to me, it meant you're giving that much energy that you're spent by the end. I'm giving everything to this workshop now. And so the fear is right because in nature, the only time people are looking at you, bunch of eyes, animals, is when they're about to eat you. So prepare your body so that there's things like keep yourself hydrated, rehearse, get to the gig early. If you've got a script, don't have it written down single spaced blue tack it to the wall above your camera or have nice neat notes if it's in person just really nice neat note just glance down you may not use them but again these are tiny stress reducers so acknowledge it's stressful i do i always have a change of shirt because i get a bit sweaty not because it's hot high hot temperature it's because of the stress so things like that acknowledge the stress every actor acknowledges the stress but she manages it by getting there early wearing the right things preparing the content 
and also knowing that in the moment you're on the stage, whether it's a virtual or real one, you're giving everything. Turn off the phone and be truly in the moment, whether you're improvising or in a script. It's, it's, it's so stimulating that because there are certain things I do without thinking about it. You've just reminded me, I think, yeah, that's good. And certain things I used to that I've stopped doing that I should do again. And so I'm hoping that so much of what you've said is triggering possibility thinking in the audience that hmm, that might work for me. Little things like I'm going for a nap now or whatever it is. Brilliant, Neil. Thank you. Um, it'd be amazing if you ever wrote a book about people skills. If you did, <laughs> what would it be called? It's called Seven Steps to Improve Your People Skills. Oh, there um, we go. <laughs> it's available on Amazon and Kindle. Please, uh, buy the, every chapter begins with L. Uh, listen, link, learn, lighten, lighten the mood, <laughs> have lots of fun. And the last one is leave well. So uh, hopefully I'll do that. But and, and think about Mark when he finishes this, what's he gonna say? Thanks very much, everyone. See you later. He's gonna say things that remind us what a great time we've had. So uh, that's the one of the things I would say. And also just finally a little plug for our show at Shakespeare's Globe. 7 o'clock, 25th of October, comedystoreplayers.com. It'd be great to see everybody there. We'll finish at 20 past eight. We're just doing one through. And you can bring your under 18s. That's what's most exciting for us because you see young people in the theater. I'm going to have to find an under 18. <laughs> All of mine are older than that now. Neil, I just want to say a massive thank you to, to you. And I know you can stay with just a little bit. So what we are going to do now is ask everyone to go into a quick breakout and share what you've learned. So it's the oh so chance to share, right? So what are the big takeouts for you and what are you gonna do? Share that with people you might have met before or complete strangers. And the beauty of the sharing is it embeds the intention in your brain. So it's eight minutes in total as a breakout with hopefully people that will stimulate your thinking even more on the oh and the so what. And then when we come back, we'll just, uh, captivate or, or capture all of the things we've just talked about in summary and uh, leave you on a high. So Amanda, you're gonna put everyone into breakout groups. I think, did we say threes or fours, something like that, yeah, four might be we, good. We certainly did. I've improvised 14 breakout rooms. Here we go. Brilliant, thank you. So you didn't hold I remember back somebody saying fashion. to me, Mark, I was remember somebody saying to me that the human brain starts working for the moment you're born, but only seems to stop the moment you stand up to give a speech in public. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, three out of four fear public speaking. <laughs> and you can see it. You can see most people who've got these PowerPoint slides with too many words on it are awkward and too quick when they speak because they don't want to be there. Yeah, somebody actually admitted that to me once. I said, what are you thinking when you're doing this? He said, I just want to go as quick as possible so I can get off. And, <laughs> and I said, I'm sure that comes across. <laughs> and in, in some respects, I think you shouldn't be made to do that. Um, you, you should, everyone should have a chance to at least have a sustainable way of not fearing it, of respecting it, but not being riven with absolute terror. Yeah, yeah. Because well, that's why, you know, I, I, I have thought several times about bringing leadership teams to the comedy store and getting, seeing the demonstration of what to do and then getting them up there. Right, you're on stage. Come on. Well, no <laughs> I, I, um, that, that's a different thing because uh, people will think they have to be funny and they don't. No. And they have to think I, I have to work without a script and they don't. But, but the, the, the thing is, you've got on one hand, somebody, I've got to learn my script word for word that somebody else has written. You don't want that. On the other hand, just go ahead and talk about something. Ah, that's too scary. So if you can have, you have a rough idea. What you something in the middle. Say. Yeah. But you would, you would host something like that, wouldn't you? You'd facilitate that learning. Yeah, well, I do days at the comedy store where we do a bit of improv, a bit of storytelling, just coming on and off stage standing on a stage with an audience uh, of yeah, 400 seats just getting used to going like that rather than like that and we can work with that amanda can't we yeah yeah and it's sort of fun because clients. uh yeah and we also do cake as well <laughs> andreas good to see you ciao i'm there if it's cake ciao. i'm there if it's cake <laughs> yeah 
so well we we can do it we can do a day at the comedy store there's um, a pizza's at five o'clock we can open the bar even stay for a show afterwards if uh so, all of that sounds fantastic pizza's bar pizza's bar and a cake yeah, <laughs> you had me there yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, all you have to do is with some crappy presentations won't they yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well we've uh, we've got a screen as well so we film you talking and no matter how long mark and i may say to you tell it like you mean it etc you watch yourself on a screen for seven seconds you'll realize you're shifting around you're not really talking very clearly and i don't have to tell you anything you say just look at you and then just things like lift up your hands look at the audience and the whole thing is better uh the content will come but just kind of lift up your body look around smile by the way mark my my best tips if i've got no time with you i just say three things pause breathe smile because most people forget to do all three yeah 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 love it love it I've, I've kind of said that at various parts of this session unscripted i've got there eventually i think <laughs> mark mark francis yes. before yes. we start the next section mark terrell um yes. needed a quick rundown on frame so if you were to hold up your frame sheet have you got that handy yep. yes i do probably then mark said. terrell you're ready you can take a photo i'm going to spotlight is he spotlighted for you oh wait a minute let me get rid of my background for are a you ready second. everybody screenshot ready steady go got it okay there we go there we go so how long have we got before they come back amanda well they're all back everyone's back yeah. everyone's back awesome yeah, brilliant we've thank been back you ages listening to mark just well, nattering to with neil neil could yes. you answer that question around how do you manage distractions? I think it'll be useful for everybody. How do you manage distractions? Well, uh, I would say use them. So if somebody comes in, so one person was saying they've had a phone call from a daughter saying there's a gas leak, uh, just use it. So for example, somebody coming into the shot, the Amazon person at the front door, use it. That's why I always like it if people can turn their cameras on because we can feel work like we're associating even though if i can't meet you in real life i can have a look at your bookshelves i can have a look at what's going on in your life so use it and in in the room where i am now it's the printer so during lockdown remote schooling my children were printing stuff out so i think it's fair enough to say oh get there goes the printer and then somebody on the call is going oh phew then i could admit i've got to go and pick up something or i'm wearing my slippers the best one was somebody said do you mind if I just step out because we're having a car delivered and my teenage daughter's in her nighty on the drive? So, um, but it became a thing for us. It's just okay. Um, what's she wearing? What's up? You know, what kind of car is it? And um, why can't you tell them to go away? Because our meeting is much more important than your car. Just things like that, where you—that's improv, basically. It's listen, use everything as an offer. There's always something we can use, even if it's not funny. It's just. Oh, right. We're all acknowledging our humanity, our vulnerability. Brilliant. Thank you. And for me, I'm, I'm going to hand back to Amanda in a moment. I just wanted to summarize a couple of things that I've said and, and to reinforce, I think, some of the main messages. One of them is this. The way we have been educated to present largely has got in the way of us being the best that we can be when we are presenting. And this is a decent challenge and opportunity for all of us that think audience and behavior in detail first, and it fundamentally changes the content. Then when we get to content, if you're not already someone who's confident and an expert in cracking content, we've got your savior. It's Claire with an I, so it's C-L-A-I-R-E, and she's available, Claire Winter is Claire's surname. So, if you don't have the instant ability to be brilliant at content, Claire can help. In terms of delivery, and Neil and I were talking about options to use his expertise, seeing yourself present, and Neil has various ways to do that, is a brilliant way to self-assess. I could be better. So please use that, if you like, creative options to how you show up when you show up, be it face-to-face -face or online. 
And one of the quotes I tend to put up when we are in person behind me in, in a studio when we're doing presenting with impact is this one. A ship in port is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. And if you apply that principle to you as a communicator, human beings are actually made to be able to communicate and communicate authentically and in the moment. And so I hope if nothing else today, some of the things that we have shared, Neil, Claire and myself, will inspire you to be bolder in everything to do with how you communicate. Amanda, back to you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. I've got a couple of dates for your diary and I've also got for you an offer for to get some more Mark type coaching. So before I do that, I've got a little story. Yesterday, Mark and I went to see a the CEO of a large retailer who has had an amazing year. They are brilliantly successful. They've got an unbelievably good strategy for next year. I can't, I mean, you know, to the naked eye, can't see that it's going to fail. However, we went to see them because the CEO, this is the CEO, um, had realized that his team, his leadership team, his directors could be more impactful, particularly online, but actually in person as well. And when we talk about this ship, the, sh the ship, what was it again? The ship. A ship out. in port is safe. Yeah, the ship. He was basically wanting to take his team out into the harbor because he realized that if they could really, really land the message with impact in all of their different authentic styles, they would be even better. And that is the absolute crux of our use by network. It is the crux of our use by a leaders community. And it is actually why we've been running discovery days like this. Um, so that was my story that I wanted to tell you because we've got some interesting things for you. Let me share my screen. First of all, expert, exceptional leaders seek help. Now, one of the things I'm just going to tell you is that if you want, would like to look at some people's faces, possibly mine or possibly some of us at the same time as looking at screen, there's two lines in between the screen and the faces. If you pull it left hand, then you should be able to see more faces. And that is a really brilliant top tip that I got well, probably sometime last year that means that you can actually see faces as well as screen. And I'm hoping that Mark is still spotlighted because I'm going to ask Mark to describe the offer that he has created for this discovery day. During lockdown, a bit like Neil, when suddenly the world stopped in terms of live training for us. I had time on my hands and I thought I'm just going to put some of what I shared earlier and more online. So I've done a series of videos as learning tools, which are all about presenting with impact. And five of those modules make a huge difference. All 11 are, are relevant, but the five most relevant have put together and said, if you would like to carry on self learning, that can be done online. Watch the video in terms of explanation, one on demonstration and then an assignment and then use us as coaches to help you on a real presentation, make it absolutely top draw. So we just want to offer that to people if that is something that would bring extra value and relevance right now. Thank you. And Bertrand, earlier you'd said about how, Mark, do you maintain your level of enthusiasm throughout this discovery day? And how do I create more enthusiasm with what I'm doing? And actually, how do you do it with authenticity whilst remaining, whilst using your flow and your style, but at the same time being able to flex your style a little bit towards the style of the people that you're trying to impact? So we have our next discovery day is called Discover the Power of Your Leadership Style. Many of you who know us and Neil, who's actually done it with his, I can, I'm looking there and I can see that Neil's actually done it with his bookcase, um, will know that we work with those four color styles of leadership. We're gonna, we've got a really natty online way of you actually finding out your leadership style using a card game online, which I'm very proud of. And, and we've got some guests who are gonna talk about how thinking about their own personal leadership style has helped them as leaders to grow their businesses 
That is on the 4th of November. And finally, on the 8th of December, I'm just I'm just hoping I can I might be able to eyeball Neil here and Claire um, to give us some input here. Um, we have some guests coming to talk about storytelling. Mark's talked a lot about storytelling, as did Claire and as did Neil. It's such an amazing skill. It is an amazing leadership and competency. And that's what this one is going to be all around. How do you make sure that your strategic story gets through from, remember the CEO of the retailer yesterday, the message gets through right from the boardroom, right through with massive, amazing energy to your customers. All that remains for me to, to say is... Thank you so much for being here. Mark, as ever, although you are a colleague of mine, I learn something every single time I watch you. And um, are you going to say something about an egg? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so did she, I need to ask, this is the end of the story. Was the egg boiled at the end? It was, yeah. So right, she said, there you go. and so we all expected it to smash again. And she said, well, you know, don't judge a book by its cover because this one's got inner strength and inner belief now. And she dropped it and didn't break. Fabulous. There's the end of the story. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming, everybody. And hopefully we'll see you on the 4th of November.